Hello and welcome to my reaction to Turnabout Storm Part 5. Before I begin, there are a couple of things I want to address. First of all, I have to correct something that I said back in Part 2. I had criticized Twilight for saying the courthouse was inspired by human architecture, even though she had never seen a human before. However, it is established in this fan work that all of the pony generations coexist in the same world, including G1, where humans are quite prominent, although Phoenix himself is from a separate reality. Second, apparently some of you think I'm being unfair for a number of reasons when I criticize these videos for being too long. One point that's been brought up is that the investigations in the games take a long time. And that's true, but I don't think that argument really applies here because in the games, you're the one investigating the scene. You're the one examining the evidence and looking for people to talk to. Here, you're just watching a movie and it's a very different experience. In fact, poking around at the environment is usually what makes the game take so long. And that's not even an issue here. All that stuff happens automatically automatically, so you're basically left with all the cutscene dialogue that happens in between the actual gameplay. And it's that dialogue that I'm criticizing, which is really a shame because that's supposed to be the good stuff. To that end, I've also had some people think that my problem was with certain information being misleading, but that's not what I'm criticizing either. I understand that it's a mystery, and it's supposed to keep you guessing. I'm fine with scenes taking a long time just so long as we're getting new information, but a lot of the dialogue rambles on for no reason, and it's a especially noticeable during the jokes. A lot of times they end up spending several minutes hammering in a joke that wasn't funny the first time, or at least it would have been better if they had moved on sooner. And again, I'm really trying not to pick on the voice acting, but here's the thing. I don't know if the newer Phoenix Wright games have voiceovers, but I do know that the original Ace Attorney pretty much just had written text, and in that case, you can take however long you need to read the dialogue. But when you add voiceovers, there has to be a certain flow to the scene. When characters are just idly chit-chatting or bantering back and forth, it kills the experience to have these long pauses between dialogue boxes, or to have characters unnecessarily draw out all their lines, or even repeat the same thing over and over again when we already know it's not that important. That's what I'm complaining about. Now, thankfully, not everything here is like that, and the series does seem to be getting better as it goes along, but when it happens, you definitely notice it. Anyway, let's talk about part four of the series, which picks up back in the courthouse. Again, there will be spoilers. Speaking of which, as the thumbnail gives away, Gilda is the main witness this time, and of course, she lies through most of her testimony. It even gets to the point where Trixie can't tolerate her anymore, and Trixie practically had it set up for Gilda to get away with whatever she wanted in the first place. When everything finally gets settled, here's what we learn. As it turns out, Gilda was the one delivering the perfume when she spotted Dash talking to Ace. Hiding in a tree, she listened in on their conversation until the cloud went off and Dash flew away. Way. Gilda tried to chase her, but she dropped her delivery bag. After spending several minutes looking for it, she got bored and went back to the crime scene, discovering the now-dead Ace. Not lying under the cloud, but instead several feet away next to Pinky's Fried Golf Club, which everyone seems to regard as a useless stick. Yep, 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 I am feeling really good about that lightning rod theory. Remembering what happened at the end of Griffin the Brush Off, Gilda became overwhelmed by emotion and decided to frame Dash for the murder by moving the body underneath the storm cloud. In the present, Gilda has a very heartfelt moment with Rainbow, regretting everything that happened between them right before flipping off Phoenix and telling him to watch his back as she gets arrested. Unfortunately, Rainbow is found guilty anyway. While Phoenix's defense revolved around Ace being killed by the second lightning bolt, Trixie argues that it might have been a dud, and they still have no proof of what happened to it. You know, aside from the burned metal stick that everyone keeps ignoring, but I'll get back to that. And ultimately, it seems more reasonable that he simply got knocked several feet away after being struck by the first bolt. And actually, this does seem like a pretty believable outcome. As in the actual court system, it isn't always necessarily about proving someone to be guilty or innocent, as it is about knocking holes in the other side's argument. In this case, Trixie can't even prove that she's right, but that doesn't matter. She just has to make Phoenix's argument look weaker than hers. But then Fluttershy comes in and testifies that she saw someone matching Sonata's description carrying the metal stick away, presumably to drop it in the lake where Twilight originally found it back in Part 3. Phoenix just barely convinces the judge to 
allow this testimony, and as we head into the final part of the series, there are a number of things that still need to be addressed. Did Sonata really kill Ace, and why would she do that if she had already written a letter saying that she simply didn't want to work with him anymore? Was he blackmailing her too? Actually, wait, Sonata was in charge of the blackmail stuff, so was she blackmailing herself? Is she going to pull the trigger on Phoenix and have him and Pinky arrested? Then there's the issue of Fluttershy not seeing Apple Bloom exit the forest. Now, obviously Fluttershy wouldn't lie, but it is the one thing casting doubt on her testimony. Speaking of Apple Bloom, she did run into something in the forest before. Could that thing have been Gilda or possibly Sonata? Will Twilight unlock the chains around Trixie's heart and possibly turn this into a ship fic? And finally, they bring up Cruise Control again, who could possibly have some useful information, except that he attacked Phoenix and is now acting like a spaz in jail. So they're understandably doubtful about letting him speak in public. Well, the final part is over two and a half hours long, so there should be enough time to answer all of this and more. As for my personal opinion, I said before that I prefer the trial scenes as they tend to be a lot more focused on the mystery, and we get a lot of information here, making this one of the stronger entries in the series. The one thing that's really bugging me, though, is that they keep changing how the storm cloud works. Originally, we're told that unlike in real life, there is no thunder in Equestria. Instead, the lightning produces its own sound. But then later, we're told that when the lightning strikes something, it causes a vibration, and that's where the sound comes from. Incidentally, in real life, thunder is caused by the expansion of air being displaced by the lightning, which is different from both explanations that were given here. And for the purpose of a fan work set in a fictional cartoon setting, I'm willing to go with these changes as long as they make their rules clear. The problem is that the explanations we get here are fundamentally different from each other as well. In fact, there are times when the ponies themselves don't seem to understand how it works, and that's kind of a big deal in a mystery where it's vitally important to understand why one out of three lightning bolts doesn't make any sound. Anyway, the next part is a big one, so maybe they'll figure it out. I'll see you next time for the conclusion to Turnabout Storm.